Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn, and I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. So uh, information services resources for people across the globe who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and the associated businesses and so on. You'll find lots of information at medcomsnetworking.com and, and the associated website. So you'll find lots of video content, for instance, at Network Pharma TV. Uh, all these webinars are recorded, um, plus other content um, at Network Pharma TV. Um, and a shout out to those of you who are interested in joining Medcoms, maybe as a medical writer, or account manager, or whatever, um, have a look at firstmedcomsjob.com where we're specifically providing information for you. Uh, these webinars are great. Uh, we can get people involved from all over the world. We've got an international audience again today and we get experts and specialists coming in and talking about all manner of matters uh, related to medcoms. And today we've got Catherine and Paul talking about managing stress. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to simply hand over to Paul. We're going to have a presentation and a bit of a Q&A. So those of you in the audience, please um, get ready to join in because uh, that makes it much more engaging. Uh, but Paul, over to you to lead us away. Thank you very much. So we'll just bring up uh, bring up our slides. We are going to spend a few minutes talking through some slides with a bit of a training um, element, um, an education part, and then, like Peter says, some questions towards the end. But today, Catherine and I are here to talk about working effectively in health communications. We know it's a hugely demanding place to work, whether it's medcoms or health comms or any kind of ilk of agency or, or in-house um, support. We working in a fast paced industry like this, it's very common that stressful situations occur. Um, but we're here to talk to you today a bit more about stress and what we can do to turn that stress into a, a force for good. Just in terms of today, um, a few kind of housekeeping um, recommendations, closing emails and browsers, avoiding distractions and things like that. But please do, um, please, like Peter says, do put questions and comments into the chat. We're here to kind of listen to what you have to say and to help as well. So please do use that function um, throughout. The other element is that today we are talking about mental well-being and stress and pressure ilking into the sort of mental health domain, which can be quite triggering for some people. Um, if you are feeling triggered or if you want to go and seek further support, then there are a range of different providers you can go to. If you're in the UK, then then uh, we've listed out the main ones that Catherine and I um, are aware of and use. But if you're outside of the UK, then the best thing to do is just search mental health support in your area. And that should bring up um, results where you can go to to find to find a bit more. Uh, so on to today then. So uh, my name is Paul Hutchings. Um, I'm founder of Fox and Cat, which is an integrated healthcare communications agency. I um, supported Peter a couple of times last year. So a few people on today's call may may already have uh, met me or know about Fox and Cat. But um, as an agency, I wanted to set up something different. We know um, stress and pressure can be large in comms. And I wanted to create an agency that considered that in our response to clients so that we didn't put our clients or our teams under that unnecessary pressure. Um, I've worked in health comms for about 20 years in total, always agency side, um, and I am a mental health first aider, uh, as is Catherine. Yes, and hi everyone, I'm Catherine Keddy, and I'm actually an executive coach. I am a healthcare communications consultant, I'm a business leader, and also most importantly, a human being. I currently run my own coaching business in which I help leaders and future leaders to create empowering ways of thinking and leading and living in order to unlock their potential. Um, and before this, like Paul, I worked for 20 years in on agency side in the fast paced, high pressure, but hugely rewarding world of healthcare communications. So I am no stranger to the demands of the industry and the workplace. Um, and I'm really on a mission along with Paul here to create a communications industry that thrives, one in which stress and pressure can be used as a force for good, not as a necessary evil. So to start this webinar and kick things off and give us all a chance to sort of arrive in the session and get to know each other a little bit, we're going to give you a little task. So I want to ask each of you to just take a few, well, 30 seconds more than anything, because we're tight on time, to think of a song that best describes you and reflects your personality. So within 30 seconds, I'm going to then pick a couple of people randomly. And uh, Peter has agreed that we can open the microphones for this session. And I'm going to ask those two people at randomly to share the name of their song, the reason why you chose it, and to give us a couple of lines, to sing us a couple of lines from it um, so that we can get to know that song. 
So I'm just going to give you just a few seconds to have a think. And, and then I'll come back and pick a couple of people on the call at random. So hopefully, I know it wasn't long, but I'm sure that you've got something top of mind. So I can't wait to hear what you've all come up with. So first, um, let's see, I'm going to call on, actually, don't, don't worry. I'm really not actually going to make any of you do this. Um, but I am interested to know how that little exercise made you feel what came up for you as you were thinking that you might have to sing to everyone in this room I'm just gonna try and have a look at the chat here and for some wow. reason I can't can't open it we've got a oh, few can on you see what on. there's a few on there yeah, so hang on, it's moving really fast as we've got lots of people come in to say their minds have gone blank, that we teased, <laughs> mild panic, panic, absolutely not, loads of, uh, yeah, the sorts of reactions I imagine we would we would want to see, uh, or expect to see rather. A hundred percent. And I can imagine, absolutely, um, we've all experienced some kind of biological, physiological and psychological reaction to that task. And we often come out fighting, like some of you have suggested. <laughs> um, or perhaps we wanted to run away again, like some of you have suggested and run as fast as possible in the opposite direction. Or maybe we've clammed up and frozen, absolutely can't think of anything. The mind's gone completely blank or really we wanted the ground to open up and swallow us whole. Some of us perhaps felt a little bit angry some of us maybe got scared, like, oh, absolutely no way. Some of us may have even got excited. I'd love to know if there's any of you outside that out there that got excited. Um, and some of us just may have wanted to, like, vomit. Um, but all of us have just experienced some kind of physical reaction to that. So an increase in heart rate, perhaps, or sweaty palms, or flushing coming up from the neck up through the face. Uh, perhaps an increase in your breathing rates um, and maybe you've fidgeted in your chair and like started biting your nails and that's because um, your stress response has just kicked in and that is a biological psychological and physiological chain reaction that's lightning fast and absolutely essential to survival and that is stress the way that we react when we feel under pressure or threatened. And it usually happens when we're in a situation that we don't feel like we're able to manage or control. It's completely, completely natural. I threw you all an unexpected task, a stressor, if you like, which in that moment put you under pressure and kickstarted that powerful biological, physical and psychological chain reaction. So what is that chain reaction? It's known as our stress response. And we are biologically programmed to deal perfectly and brilliantly with acute stresses. In fact, we rely on this acute stress response because our life literally depends on it. So when our senses, our sight, our smell, our touch, our hearing, in the case that we just had, detect a threat in our surroundings, our amygdala, or what is known as our lizard brain kicks in. This is the part of our brain that's designed to keep us safe from harm. It is super sensitive to any sort of danger, which once upon a time were life-threatening things such as an attack from a saber-toothed tiger or a raging forest fire coming towards um, the village. But despite the amygdala being lightning fast and incredibly powerful, it hasn't yet learned to tell the difference between a saber-toothed tiger or a raging fire and a demanding email, a difficult piece of feedback that we may receive, or a tight deadline. 
and therefore our biological response is the same. So once activated, the amygdala talks to our hypothalamus, which in turn activates our nervous system, flooding our body with adrenaline and cortisol, which increases our heart rate and our sweat response. It increases our blood pressure and therefore the amount of blood that can flow to our neuromuscular system so that we're literally ready to run. It increases our breathing rates, divert more oxygen to where we need it. And it increases our conversion of blood sugar into energy, as well as increasing our alertness, both mental and sensory. And at the same time, it shuts down any biological functions that are not immediate um, or vital to our immediate survival. So if left unnoticed, unattended over time, the neural networks controlled by our amygdala can become powerful habitual reactions to even small triggers that we find in our day to day, which can lead to unwanted and unsustainable feelings and actions that can actually over time have a negative effect on our well-being. So I'm going to just quickly talk about the different types of stress that we can experience. The first one is acute stress which is exactly what we've just experienced and what we've just been talking about. A short term stress from a one time event or sudden challenge that we are actually perfectly built to manage and respond to. The second type of stress that we can experience is what's called episodic acute stress. And this is a stress response that's the result of going from one episode of short term stress to another, but without having a break in between. And it's really common when you work in a demanding job where you're constantly chasing deadlines or dealing with challenges. And if left unchecked and unmanaged, episodic stress or episodic acute stress can leave you feeling mentally and physically drained and can eventually take a toll on your well-being. The third type of stress, which I'm sure most people have heard of as well, is called chronic stress, which is a long-term stress from a persistent trauma or issue. Oh, sorry, what's going on here? That's better. Um, a persistent stress um, that um, is constant and actually really hard to escape. And it's this type of stress where we don't recover from each episode of stress that means we end up in an always on or a constant fight or flight response, which if left unchecked can actually lead to burnout. So I'd be really interested from the people here who's experienced what type of stress in their lives or in their day to day. Uh, perhaps you can just put one, two or three in, in the chat. And we can, we can come back to it when we've collected a few responses. Despite the, psychologi uh, the, the psychological and physiological reaction to stress being similar in all of us, actually the way that stress shows up for us all as individuals is unique and very different. Um, there are lots of different signs and symptoms and responses to stress, which include physical symptoms such as headache, tiredness and exhaustion, or elevated heart rate like we talked about before. There are behavioral symptoms such as you can end up being coming across as kind of bossy or arguing with people, or you could be shouting, crying, or even withdrawing. Um, or you could turn to things like food and building unhealthy behaviors, uh, such as uh, relying on substances to help you deal in those stressful times and moments. There are emotional symptoms such as anxiousness or moodiness or irritability, or even on the other side of that, there's there's boredom and isolation and um, depression. And then there's also cognitive symptoms such as an inability to make decisions, uh, procrastination, uh, poor judgment, um, or a complete inability or a lack of, of focus. Great. So we've um, we've explored now what stress is and the different types, but what, what actually is stress doing when we turn and look at the workplace? 
So we all work in communications or associated with it. And we'll come on to talk a bit more about the specifics of the sector in a moment. But just to frame the conversation, this isn't a problem which is isolated to agencies or high 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 pressure industries alone. We know that 13.7 million working days were lost last year due to stress, anxiety and depression with a cost of just under 30 million, 28.3 billion, uh, sorry, per year. So it's a huge amount of money and it's hugely impacting everybody in the workplace. What's interesting when you start to look into the data a bit more is that 60% of the Gen Z, so the 18 to 24 uh, range within Gen Z, um, feeling this huge amount of pressure to succeed. So against a backdrop of what's already quite a challenging workplace, we've got younger workers entering the workforce who are feeling huge pressure to succeed, which only adds to the, to the pressure. Um, encouragingly, when you look at the data around the people that feel that stress can help them to thrive um, and to grow, it's just over half. So there is a positive area to stress, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, I think where some of the problems still lie, two, two, um, three quarters rather of employees report moderate to high stress levels, um, which is very high and it's very in keeping what, with what we've been talking about before. Um, and I think as well, one, one that surprised me, I actually thought it'd be a bit higher, is a third of people that report high levels of stress and that it impacts their productivity. Um, I think I, I feel like it should be higher. Interesting to know your thoughts, uh, given the, the statistics. But uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a very... Um, I mean, there's a lot to gain from tackling stress in the workplace. Let, let's put it like that. Um, so if we turn to the next slide, we can then focus a bit more on the actual impact of stress in communications. For full transparency, this is data that comes from the Mental Health Audit, which is done each year by the CIPR and the PRCA. They've run it for four years. Um, the fifth year data is due out soon. Um, but what's interesting when you look at the data across the last four years is that these trends, these areas that are on the slide, actually have remained relatively unchanged through that period. And given that last year there were a few interventions um, under the tree, which we'll talk about later, um, being one and a few other interventions, there hasn't been a huge amount of sort of industry wide effort to make sure stress is tackled. Um, so we're relatively confident these figures will remain, but we can't be entirely sure. So that said, nine in 10 people in comms experience stress. When we talk about stress here, we're talking about the types one and two, um, where you feel uh, overwhelming levels, whether that's episodic or whether that's on a slightly more ongoing basis. Um, but it's a huge amount and it has remained relatively unchanged. The key triggers for that being, unsurprisingly, workload, uh, impending deadlines, not feeling good at your job. So things like the imposter syndrome, um, which, which um, people generally feel at some point in their careers, particularly around times of promotion. Um, when we start to look less about the individual and more about the team, unclear expectations come up quite a lot. So the conversations happening between team members to brief in projects, brief out projects, and all this results in a poor work-life balance. Um, and this, as I say, is a relatively unchanged picture, but unchanged, like Catherine mentioned, in the chronic spectrum leads to burnout. And there was some research done last year by Women in PR looking at this exact, uh, exact matter. So um, the research was carried out across people who work in communications in 2023. Um, it looked at burnout in particular and 66, so two thirds of people who have now considered leaving their job due to burnout. Um, there's a massive sense, 92%, that the way that the industry works at the moment um, is very hard to switch off. We know now WhatsApp is no longer a personal thing. Many teams in agencies and in businesses will use WhatsApp to communicate amongst themselves. And that then ekes into your phone time in the evening. And so we can start to really see why the barriers are graying. Um, but that's a very worrying statistic. When you look at kind of the number of people who are stressed and anxious, um, still finding it quite hard to talk about it. 60% is quite high. It's not 100%, which is great. So at least 40% of the people are finding it okay to talk about their problems. But obviously, we'd like that to be higher. And I think where 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 work is needed is this 11% of people saying that they have been completely supported, meaning 89% don't feel completely supported. Um, and so there's definitely room for improvement to make sure really that people that don't even reach the point of burnout, that, that's kind of the goal. Um, but when they do, making sure that the support is in place so that they can return to work in the way that works for them and for the businesses is, is optimal. Um, and in terms of, so I mentioned earlier about Under the Tree, we did um, a campaign last year through Fox and Cat, which really focused on training and education around the key barriers to overcoming stress in the workplace. And uh, this campaign reached about four and a half thousand people globally. 
we did evaluation uh, from 151 respondents, 76% from comms. So it's relatively representative of what I'm about to present of, of the um, challenges and opportunities for comms. And of that 76%, over half were from agencies, about a third from uh, in-house and then 15% independent freelancers, uh, consultants and the likes. So in this, we, we ask people, what are the main things causing you stress and pressure that you'd like support with? And while, of course, the data that came through was quite thorough, we've whittled it down into three areas with kind of focus areas under, under each. So workload, as we expected, still comes up. The idea of internal communications, the way that teams communicate with each other, um, the culture of the business, is it open for open conversation, um, was another area. And also very interestingly, and I think this one appears on most uh, most annual reviews about how agencies and clients are working together because that relationship does require constant attention uh, and care and quite rightly so. Um, and a route to overcoming some of the stresses to make sure that relationship is as healthy as it possibly can be, having open conversations with clients and the likes. So once you look at that and we ask them the question, OK, so bearing in mind the things that are causing stress, how would you feel if we were to overcome those things? For me, my kind of my heart lit up and uh, I was very encouraged to see these words come through feeling of karma, much more peace, more productive, which is obviously what we want from a business perspective. But really importantly for me, this idea that people want to spend more time with their family. You don't want to be sitting in front of a computer screen unnecessarily when you can be spending time with your family and your loved ones. And if we can get to a point where stress is reduced to the point where people have more time to enjoy life and, and life outside of work, then that's really the place we want to, to end up at. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting to know at the moment, we, we were asking ourselves this question, has it become normalised in communications that this idea of you know, huge stress is, is just a part of the role? Um, how do you feel about that? Is that something you see where you work or is it slightly different? We'd, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. And just picking up on that, looking at the comments from the last question we asked around how many of these different types of stress has people experienced? it it feels relatively normal for everybody to have experienced at least two, if not three types of, of the stress that we've just talked about. Um, so there's definitely, you know, whether it's normalized across the industry, we're it's very normal for us to feel um, this kind of stress. And the stress that we've been talking about is sort of negative stress. It's stress that gets us onto sort of a downward spiral through sort of, you know, especially when we're talking about epi continued epi episodic acute stress or chronic stress, down this spiral of sort of ex fatigue and then exhaustion towards burnout. But it doesn't have to be this way because there is a fourth type of stress, which is called eustress, or what we like to call optimum stress sweet spot. So, in this place, this optimum stress sweet spot, um, it serves a natural and physiological purpose that can help us solve important problems and learn and grow from our experiences. It can stretch us outside of our comfort zones. It can challenge us. And instead of eliminating or dampening down stress, there are real benefits if we can reframe our understanding of it we can actually embrace it and we can optimize it. The reality is, is that no meaningful life is stress-free and no meaningful or workplace or job is stress-free. But if we can manage it correctly, stress can actually be an engine of personal growth and of also peak performance. So as we mentioned, we all have our own stress thresholds that define the different performance stages of our own stress responses. Um, and what triggers a stress response in one person can be very, very different from what stress, uh, stresses uh, somebody else. So it's important that you understand your personal relationship to stress and where you are on this stress response curve and how to understand these different performance stages for you so that you can more effectively work out how you can move and then operate from your optimal stress sweet spot. So how do you go about doing that? The first step is being able to switch, of being able to switch from negative stress to positive stress is by first understanding your own relationship to stress. And to do that, it's important to know how and to tune into how stress shows up in your body for you how it shows up in your emotions. 
so the physical symptoms and the emotional symptoms, and then how it dictates and drives your behaviours and your actions, so the cognitive and the uh, behavioural symptoms. And that can be done by just looking and stopping and, and getting to know and identifying what's going on for you in, in, in your body, in yourself. Once you know this, you'll be able to detect when your stress response has started and when your stress response is, is, is hitting. Um, and then more effectively, you can track where it's showing up and in response to what type of stressor. So you'll be able to audit your environment in order to be able to tell and look at what kind of stresses are creating that stress response in you. Um, and by doing that, you will be able to become more conscious, become more aware and also begin to anticipate when your stress response is going to kick in. Once you know your response and what is then triggering it, you can begin to create options for yourself around ways that you can distance yourself from the stress, reframe the stress into something more of a, a more positive rather than negative, and then create new ways of thinking and behaving, communicating and working that will change your relationship to that stressor and that stress and create more control for yourself and more agency in yourself to know how to respond um, and embrace stress in the positive. However, it's not just enough to know your action to know your options. Um, the The reality is is that that managing stress is a lifelong habit. Um, it's a lifelong practice. So you need to take action, and you need to do something that will disrupt your learned default stress response. You know, our brain has got used, as we talked about before, to and it defaults to the way that we have already always reacted to these um, to these stresses as they come in. However, we can retrain our brain, and with practice, we we can create new neural pathways that can change the way that we respond and we deal with stress in these moments. So, taking action to begin to sort of short circuit that default uh, stress response, and then practicing that over time to form new habits is the way that we can then train ourselves to get into using stress as a force for good rather than as a necessarily evil. So whose responsibility is it? We've talked so far all about what you can do or what I can do to change and manage my relationship more effectively to stress. And that's because each and every one of us does have a responsibility for tackling and managing our own stress levels and responses. Because like we've said, it's a hugely personal um, issue and, and thing that we have to, to manage. However, this will really only go so far. Organisations and employers, leaders and managers within our organisations have a responsibility to help reduce any stress which may arise in their employees because of their work or their workplace. So we need a dual approach where individuals and organizations come together and can dismiss and break down the current accept it and carry on mentality to what is an increasing problem that is a threat to us all. So just in summary, um, we know in order to really make a difference in how stress manifests itself in the workplace, that it does need to live at the core of every individual's and also every organization's operations. Um, while of course having conversations around mental well-being is a fantastic thing to do, we know that training, um, training and education are critical elements. There is much more to learn, the skills to make us firstly be able to identify which type of stress we're in and therefore how to how to resolve that but also commitment it does take a lot of uh, hard work and thinking on the individual but also on an industry-wide level um, and so we believe that it's actually an industry-wide solution to an industry-wide problem everybody needs to have uh, a role everyone needs to be involved and um, together we feel very confident that well of course we can't overcome every type of stress um, we just can't predict what's going to happen we can certainly prepare ourselves more for those situations and work out where you stress or that helpful type of pressure can really come to the fore um, so there's a long way to go but it's a very exciting journey 
um, one that Catherine and I are incredibly passionate about and committed to. So um, here are our details. Please do connect with us. And we've seen loads come through on LinkedIn. So please rest assured we will connect with each and everybody um, who has put them forward. Um, and in terms of the future, Catherine and I, like I say, are hugely uh, dedicated and focused towards this issue. And those who did attend under the tree in 2023 will be hopefully pleased to hear that we are looking and rolling out uh, under the tree 2024. It's a slightly different way of working. We've learned a lot from last year. Um, so the way that we carry it forward will be very much attuned to the actual needs of the industry right now. And we'll have more on that later, but do please follow us um, on our individual profiles for now, because we'll be making those announcements over the coming months. Um, so that's it from us. Just a massive thank you to everybody for, for listening um, and for taking part. I've seen so many comments on the chat and it's, uh, it's really heartwarming to see the engagement. So thank you very much from our side for that. But I'll hand back over to Peter now to, to lead the Q&A. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, excellent. So if we can lose the slides, Catherine. Um, I'm sorry, can I just leap straight in with a question? Sorry, um, Paul, I probably just missed this. But you were referring to the study, the, the statistics in comms. And it was something like 91% of people in comms experiencing stress. I missed the context of that. Was that a survey that it's not a survey that's done every year, is it? Because you made a point that it stays very consistent. But I missed when the survey was last done and the figures you were quoting. Yes, yeah, so it started in 2019 and it's ran every year around sort of October. It is every year. Yeah, and usually they have about, well, it varies. I think the first year they had about 500 respondents and then it's kind of tapered down a bit more, which is why I imagine there's been a delay in the research coming out this year. But yes, it's repeated every year. All right, okay, I missed that. I must admit. So, but that's sort of interesting, isn't it? Because you'd have thought if you take those last four years, we've been through quite a stressful time but it but it started before covid i suppose i'm just thinking in terms of covid and then what's happened since and cost of living and all the rest of it so you'd have probably expected some sort of sense of it's getting a bit more stressful certainly most of the people i'm talking to at the moment are a bit more stressed than they were even last year but certainly from a few years ago anyway i just wanted to clarify that i'm um, sorry catherine can we lose those slides then um and oh, yeah. um sorry. we'll just answer some questions from the audience um I've got a couple I've noted down, but I would emphasize to the audience, please do put your comments into the um, into the chat or the question and answer box and we'll pick them up. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, I mean, we talk about comms, you talk about comms, but you actually talk quite a lot about PR. And I think I'm right in saying that I know I know I don't want to get bogged down in this. I know our definitions will vary and all the rest of it. But, you know, this, the, the work you've done. It would loosely be talked about as PR industry, communications industry, as opposed to medcoms. I, I'm just wondering, I, I draw a distinction between the two, and I just wonder from your point of view, whether mm. you see any distinction or whether you're not able to sort of thing. I just wanted to sort of like get your sense of that because the, the surveys you talked about, so it was PR, women in PR, whatever. I, I'd regard PR as a bit different from medcoms. I'm not going to get terribly bogged down in it. I just wonder whether you get any sense of maybe any differences across different sorts of communications businesses let's just mm. keep it very broad do you see that or not are the other are the, are the, the problems the problems everywhere sort of thing pretty much yeah it's the latter that we seem to see trends across them all that the level of research in pr seems to be higher than that done by many other industries hence us focusing a bit more on on that data but yes absolutely and i think as well any any job where you're effectively selling time or delivering something to a sort of fast paced nature will have a similar thread. So whether it's health comms or med comms, we're all under the same. If you work in agency, then there's client demands, there's trying to sort of match resource with work that's on, um, trying to find the right people for different accounts. Uh, all those challenges are very similar, um, regardless of which type of communications you work in. And actually very interestingly, the research from the CIPR and PRCA doesn't just focus on health uh, communications or medcoms it was more holistically about comms overall so we've got a blend right. of communications insight feeding into that statistic i've got you um sorry the, 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 there's actually quite a few comments coming at the moment which is great um one one of the things and then when you were talking about it, it was interesting following you catherine because you were answering my questions as i was coming up with them in my head a little bit and i was sort of thinking at one point this is very per it's very personal and you then went on to talk about how personal it is um and and I do think that's way underestimated by lots of people because you just focus on your own stressors and assume everybody else has got the same problems or something. But I think particularly in organisations, that must be quite difficult to manage because you're trying to manage a bunch of people who are being stressed by different aspects 
of whatever it is that's stressing them, if you see what I mean. And I just wonder, again, you've talked a bit about, maybe talk a little bit more about within a company where you where you are responsible for supporting a team, whether you're the manager or whether you are the person responsible for supporting mental first aid and so on. Just talk a little bit maybe about whether you've seen any differences over the last few years, because I would say there's been quite a change over the last few years in the way that agencies let's 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 go with the agencies for a moment they um they resourced the support that they can provide does that make sense yeah i think it is a personal response and i think what triggers one person doesn't trigger the other but it's really important i mean you are seeing some commonalities so some of the data that we've, we've collected shows that there are some there are some common stress triggers specifically around things like you know workload and communication and but one of the biggest things is change and change management um mm. and how you know you you mentioned Peter you know the extraordinary situation that we've been through in the past you know few years with with COVID then the cost of living all these things that created huge amounts of unexpected unanticipated change and that has definitely elevated I think our, our stress response no matter who we are and what we get stressed by just constant change and constant flux um, we're not actually built for that we don't like change we're, we're creatures of habit humans are creatures of habits so I think one of the key things is to help people um, anyone and um, to help people manage their response to change um, be able to be you know try and be more agile more resilient um, and by resilience please let's just create the right definition of resilience which is not to work harder and longer and bash your head against the same brick wall that is not what resilience actually is it's about creating a biological change to the events that you find yourself in so that you 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 learn and grow through it so I think that's what companies need to work on it's it's much less about and, and individuals need to work on actually is is being able to accept that change is inevitable it's pretty much the one thing that we know that tomorrow will not be the same as today and um, I think being able to find ways to um, you know create um, mindsets and uh, ways of being agile and resilient are going to be the critical things um, for moving us all forward no matter what actually stresses us um, stresses us out you can't fix everything for everybody but if we are fixing some of those bigger structural issues such as workload and resource and you know from a infrastructure perspective but then also building this ability to bounce uh, to bounce back or come out changed from change I think we can we can um, manage those things better I guess what I'm just all I'm thinking is what um, I know this is purely as an observer as it were albeit an interested observer but in the last five years say I mean there's been an explosion in resources that have been taken on by the agencies and their their attitudes have changed and you know when i start i think i think you both said something like 20 years i mean i you know i'll quote 30 years because i'm the old bloke in the room and um, you know when we started there weren't there wasn't much support at all and i know i know we'd probably argue for a good few years we'd be moving in the right direction but i mean covid really did probably accelerate that very very dramatically and um, there's been lots of people taken on in within businesses that stick with the agencies to support the teams and I just think I mean I think that's a, a point worth making um but it also brings with it its own sort of challenges and and changes sort of thing I just that, that's what I was sort of wondering whether you got a view on I guess you just basically so do you mean things thing. like well-being <laughs> programs is that what you're yeah meaning? I mean there's people yeah. there's there's people being taken on to run well-being programs within agencies um and and there's a there's a mushrooming of numbers of people yeah. in in groups to support um at least as far as I can see from where I'm sitting. And I, I guess it's a good thing, but it does bring its own change and, 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 and so on. The data suggests that it's actually not as helpful as people think. There's been a lot oh, okay. of research into the, these things and the data suggests that there's, there's very, that there isn't as much um, impact happening uh, for these kind of, you know, yoga sessions and I don't know, um, I don't know, Monday mindfulness or whatever it might be, um, or perhaps even, you know increasing benefits so that people can go to the gym and all of that part of that is because the infrastructure within organizations isn't changing to allow right. them to actually 
be adopted properly or to be prioritized. So if you're trying to fit all of those things and make the most of all of those things around an already heavy workload or a, a nothing's changing in terms of the way that you have to operate and the way that you have to work, it's just another thing that adds stress to an already stressful situation. So what we would, I think what's more important is that individuals do those things but they have to not just be a one you know don't just turn up once a week to do a yoga session it can help in that moment but it's more about changing the ways of being and the ways that you interact with your environment which is a lifelong practice but then also the infrastructure in which you're operating has to change to enable those things to even scratch the surface and currently i don't think the rate of change within organizations is fast enough to be able to um, so it's like sticking a big sticking plaster over something and hoping that yeah. you know doesn't, I, mean, I, I, I doesn't remember make... some yeah i remember one of the one of our webinars actually somebody was talking about culture plasters and 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 getting basically arguing that too many people it's going back a couple of years too many of the, too many of the businesses are just tick boxing and 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 applying culture plasters you know which doesn't actually in itself help it's just it makes somebody feel good about the fact that we've provided this extra bit of service or support or something. Anyway, let's not maybe go too far down that line. But I, but I do think generally as an industry, it's matured a lot. Certainly, medcoms, I, I, as I define it, has matured a lot in the last few years. And part of that has been bringing with it the sort of support services that 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 can work. Although it's interesting what you're saying. Um, so yeah, let's not have too many culture plasters. Um, there's a lot of comments in the chat about difficulty of sleeping. I don't know whether you've got any specific, Paul, have you got any specific answers? There's a few people sharing ideas as to how they get to sleep and so on. But it seems like nighttime um, is, a, is a tough time. <laughs> I, I can speak from my own uh, point of view. Yes, um, it can be tough. Um, but um, have you got any... Oh, all okay um, yeah, have you yeah, got any that. um hints and, and suggestions for anybody um, about like, how to deal with the nighttime problems they've got staying up all night worrying about what's happening yeah and it's it, it really strikes a chord i've been following the comments because it's absolutely where my stress has come up i'm pretty much okay right. through the day and then i lie in bed and suddenly everything comes whooshing in your brain and you're trying to know what to do with it so i totally understand it and like peter says love the fact that some people are starting to talk to each other about their own ways and recommending talks and things like that um for me personally and it would just be a personal view what I do is have a notepad by my bed and as the thoughts come in write them down and give yourself permission to leave them on the page because the the nature is you'll write it down and then you lie in bed and you'll carry on the thinking so there's kind of two areas firstly get it off out your brain and somewhere where you can deal with it another day and secondly just allow yourself to take the time to sleep you work incredibly hard that's why you're feeling stressed and your sleep is so important and sometimes just giving yourself permission to do that can can really help Catherine, what's, what's your um what's your trick to fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> it's it's exactly the same it's not keeping it inside because if you keep it inside you have this tendency to overthink and overplay and replay and replay and what you need if you can write it down and get it out from the head onto the page and actually see it there is a distance that's created between you and that stress and or that stressor and um i think then just taking the time to you know to 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 think about uh, some well to try and clear the brain a little bit I think just to accept that those things are there label them don't identify with them and um and find a way to sort of calm the breathing I would focus in on the breath at that point once you've got it all out and, and do a bit of mindfulness practice so don't do what Peter does and just hit the bottle <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just out of interest and maybe this is where we because we probably should wrap up but um can, just just maybe just a moment on this um because paul we ended the presentation paul with you talking about and you know it needs an industry-wide solution and i know under the tree made an impact last year and you're going to do it or you're, you're working on it for this year and there's a there's an industry-wide solution there but i just wondered whether you could pick up on that and just maybe talk more broadly about some of the industry bodies and so on and just is is there some i know you're working with a number of them so i don't know how much you can say what you can say i'm just i'm just suggesting maybe a little bit more um on what you're thinking in terms of in terms of this industry-wide solution what was possible 
That yeah, I think we can probably go yeah small way down the line because um so last year's under the tree session was thirteen sessions which focused on the very vocational things that we can do to help manage pressure. So, for example, a training session around how to have a confronting conversation. We all know that you can end up in situations with the conversation that perhaps you don't feel confident in or don't want to do and that can be incredibly hard hitting for certain people and certain personality types so last year we were focused on really helping people with these very practical tangible areas um, this year our focus moves slightly more to helping people understand stress and pressure more fully we're going to start at the basics and work our way up um, because our belief is that you people we're all different we all have different ways so what stresses me out and what stresses you out Peter and you out Catherine will be very different we'll all see parallels but they won't be the same stresses so individuals need to work out what works for them so a large focus for our under the tree program would be about helping people identify what those solutions are for them but the program itself like you mentioned Peter about wider in industry we're really keen to start helping the industry understand the current real-time challenges um, of the industry. So looking at ways that we can help uh, industry bodies like the CIPR and the PRCA better identify what their focuses are too. Um, it's early days, um, but yes, we'll be announcing more about that in due course. Okay, okay. And there's a, there's a message in there maybe, maybe to put out there, which is you're interested in presumably hearing from the industry bodies about how these things can come. Because at the end of the day, uh, however good your programme is, it need I would have I would have argued myself it needs a collaboration across the community you've got my support you know that for what it's worth but um you know you, you need people to come together around these initiatives otherwise it's not as powerful as it? it's, it's as simple as that so I just think there's a message that's worth putting out there okay we've probably we've gone past our time slightly so why don't we um although sorry Catherine I was, it looked like you were trying to say something was I interrupting you this time no, you're happy. Okay, no, you're I was happy. agreeing with you. It's okay. We've got to attack it from the different ends of the spectrum. hundred. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Look, guys, thank you very much. We, for those of you online at the moment, don't all rush away. We've got ten minutes, and we will we'll carry on talking. Um, but for the sake of the recording, um, I think this is a good place to stop. Um, say huge thanks to to both Catherine and Paul. I know I can speak for you and say please, anybody that's watching this reach out by LinkedIn, that's the easy way. Um, and, and you'd love to hear from people and keep the conversation going on, so on. Um, if I can help anybody, then obviously medcomsnetworking.com, you will know how to get hold of me. That's easy, always happy to hear from everybody. But for the purpose of the recording, I'm gonna say a big thank you to both of you. I'll give a little bit of a wave and wish everybody a good day. Take care everyone, cheers, bye.